Okay, everyone, I'm live right now, just uh, waiting for people to uh, get on board the live stream and uh, I'll get started in just a little bit. I'm just setting up technology here. Okay. Not sure how long I should wait to get this going. Hey there. Oh, I can go ahead and start. Okay. Okay, I will. Yeah. Sounds good. I guess it'll be my eyes on the ground uh, if something goes array with video or audio. Uh, please let me know. I will be pending or I'll have the chat between us open. Um, and if you want to uh, add questions, uh, you should be able to in the comment section. Um, yeah. Okay, um, well, my name is Natsum. I'm a second year uh, PhD student now at the Wyant, uh, College of Op Wyant College of Optical Sciences. 
Um, my background is in mechanical engineering and uh, I went to go work for a few years and um, now I'm uh, in the pursuit of a PhD um, in optics. So uh, today, what we're gonna be exploring is the wave nature of light. Um, and to explore the wave nature of light, what we're first gonna do is uh, explore the wave nature of water uh, because that's a very physical concept that we're familiar with. Um, and a lot of the principles uh, that you observe in water, you will also observe in uh, light. So let's get started. Um, first, I will kind of do a little uh, walk around of the demo. And this is on my laptop, so it's going to be a little bit tricky with um, walking you around the setup. Um, so first, here at the top, we have a uh, pool of water. So that there is water. Um, and here, we have a uh, wave generator. So it's got two individually actuating arms. Uh, I'm going to turn it off here for a second. Uh, it's got two individually actuating arms uh, that we can say we can either program them to uh, move together synchronously or move uh, out of phase with each other. So when one is down, the other one is up. Uh, we can also modify the uh, strength of the wave by uh, adjusting the amplitude. And then we can also adjust the frequency of the wave. Um, or the oscillation of the wave, or how quickly it oscillates. Um, so that's the setup up here. And down here we have a mirror that uh, then projects the image uh, of the water tank onto this white screen here. And so what we're gonna be viewing is the white screen. So I will uh, get us set up there, do a time check. Okay. Okay, so that's the viewing screen there. So the very first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just uh, attach this guy here to generate a spherical wave. Um, so you're familiar with the terminology as we're moving through the video. So I have it on here and you should be able to view a um, bright, dark, circular pattern. Um, and that there's a, a spherical wave. Okay. And so you can see there's a few characteristics. Um, there's a spacing, there's spacing between the light and dark regions. Um, you can also see that uh, there's, and that spacing is controlled by how quickly we're oscillating this arm up and down. Um, so if I reduce the frequency, um, it, it's kind of, there's some interaction between the camera and this, so it'll be hard to exactly see the exact uh, replica of what you see here in person. But I can reduce the frequency quite a bit, and you should see the light and dark regions begin to uh, become more spaced apart. So I'm gonna reduce it significantly there. And if I increase the frequency, the light and dark regions get closer together. And again, there's no magic here. I'm not a magician. Um, I like to think of myself as a scientist or you know, a person who likes to uh, study science. So here, it's water. I can flick some here still. Um, so next what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put a, I'm gonna generate another spherical wave on the other arm. So I'm gonna turn this down and I'm gonna put this on here. So now you should be able to uh, see two spherical waves. And right off the bat, you can see some interesting things happening. Um, First, we'll look at the region uh, here between these two spots. Um, and so what you can see here right at the center, there's 
there is this region that is uh, kind of um, staying almost constant. And so what's happening is when you have two waves and uh, you, can also, you can also think of this as like a swing set. Um, if you're pushing somebody on a swing and you push them at the same, and you push them every time they come up to the top, uh, then you will continue to uh, add to their motion. But if you uh, push them when they're not exactly at the top, you're actually going to uh, destruct, like destroy their motion. Um, and so what we call when two waves constructively, or what we call when two waves meet at the uh, same crest is constructive interference. And when they meet at uh, like kind of a high crest and a low crest, then we'll call this destructive interference. Um, and so what we're witnessing here at, at the center is uh, constructive and destructive interference happening. And we can begin to look downfield. I'm gonna move the light source a little bit so you can uh, see what's happening here. And I'm gonna increase the frequency. And increase the amplitude a little bit. And so what you can see is some kind of interesting stuff starting to happen down here is you have these points of almost uh, constant, there's some areas that are constantly remaining dark and some areas that are constant, constantly remaining light. Um, and so this is just two spherical waves interacting. Um, and this is a really powerful concept because in, uh, uh, in optics, you know, we're often trying to find out how light interacts um, with a particular elements in our optical system. Um, so the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna uh, show you kind of uh, uh, what they call slit diffraction. And I'll, I'll draw out the slit diffraction first, which is, here we have a whiteboard. Okay, so with slit diffraction, what it is is you essentially have one area that's clear. Oh, that's not a good color. You have one area that's clear, and then you have a, a slide, and then you have another area that's clear, and this is all dark. And so when you illuminate light through here, we wanna be able to understand what's happening on the other side of uh, the mask. So um, we can see that in uh, over there, you know, we generate, we're generating these spherical waves. And so when we have kind of just a flat wave coming here, the flat wave interacts with this edge here. It interacts with this edge here. It interacts with this edge here and here. And so from here, we're generating spherical waves. And I'm gonna demonstrate that over on the water wave tank. So I'm gonna stop this from vibrating. And so what I'm gonna put on to, oops, what I'm gonna put onto the uh, frequency generator is this flat bar, and that's gonna generate a flat wave uh, across the water tank. And just to show you, I'm gonna turn it on, and there's our flat wave going across the water tank. And next what I'm gonna do is I'm going to uh, set up A, uh, I'm gonna put this in the water tank, uh, like so, to represent the slit diffraction that I just uh, drew up on the whiteboard. So here is our two slits, and then uh, these are kind of, this is our mask. Uh, so basically, where light can't pass through. So actually, it's kind of cool here. You can see I just placed the first 
bit there. And if I turn up the amplitude, what you can see is at the corners, right here and right here, you can see that there, it's almost like uh, uh, generating another spherical wave at the corners. So I added And, and we're also still passing part of the flat, the flat wave through the center, just right clear through the aperture. Um, and so if you look downfield, it's, you won't really see kind of distinct bands where over here, it's uh, well lit up. This here, uh, it's hard to tell, but kind of what you're supposed to see is uh, a bright center region and a dark and dark uh, side region, like, like so. And then uh, you're supposed to just see bands of alternating brightness and darkness um, at the, uh, far field. And I'm going to try turning on the strobe and maybe that will become apparent. Or maybe we will just have a seizure. Let's see. I don't think we'll be able to see it here, but um, we should be able to see it with the light experiment that I will uh, demonstrate. Um, so just a few things, you know, I can modify here is I can increase the frequency, make it move much faster. I can decrease the frequency. Um, can decrease the amplitude, increase the amplitude. Um, so these are just little control knobs here. Um, we're going to move over to our slit diffraction experiment to um, kind of see the behavior of light, but now uh, without the water tank. So first I'll introduce the experiment. Uh, here we have a helium neon laser and power switch. And from the helium neon laser, uh, we're illuminating uh, our slit diffraction mask here. And the way that our slit diffraction mask looks like, I'll draw it on, on the board here. Is This is our slide. So that's this whole thing just outlining here. And then within the slide, we have uh, two open slits. Like that? Nope, you can't see that. And let me make our slide bigger. So on one side, we have two open slits. And then we have another pattern with three open slits. And then we have another pattern with four open slits. And uh, I believe we have one more with five open slits. So that's our mass there. And so very similar to what we were seeing before, uh, when we illuminate the two slits, we're gonna see um, kind of this uh, contrasting bands of lightness and darkness. Um, so we'll start. Uh, 
forward. And you can see there, there are uh, alternating bands of lightness and darkness. And the areas that are lit up are actually quite large. Uh, the areas that are not lit up are quite narrow. And one of the things that when we do all the math for this out is we find out that the more slits you add, the more uh, concentrated the brightness region becomes. So what we're going to show next is uh, that exact effect happening. So right now what we just demonstrated was two slits being illuminated. We're going to go to three slits. Okay, and then I'm going to zoom into the board. So with three slits, you can begin to see the uh, brightness regions becoming uh, a little bit more concentrated. You can also see into my nose, which is not good. <laughs> um, okay. And so next we're gonna go to the uh, four bands. Okay, I'm gonna try to turn off the lights to see if it becomes, uh, it's more visible. It might be too bright. It's too bright. So you can see there, uh, they're becoming a little bit more concentrated. And we'll finally move to um, illuminating five slits. And there we have very distinct bright and dark regions. And so we can explain uh, a little bit more of what's happening when we increase in slits uh, through a lot of math, uh, or we can try and explain it in a slightly more simplified uh, graphical way. Uh, so first we'll just start with two slits. So we have our laser source that was coming in. Is that better? Yeah. That was coming in like so. And we have our mask. This is a side view of our mask now. And I'm going to draw our two slits in here. And okay. And so you know, we start off, like I was saying, we generate a spherical wave here. We generate a spherical wave here and here at every corner. And then if you look down field far enough away, uh, what you're gonna see is, you know, you see this bright band, um, that actually is a little bit wider, you know, like so. And then you'll see another bright band and then another bright band, but they're starting to decrease in intensity. Um, yes, okay, so when we continue to add more slits, I'm going to delete or I'm going to uh, erase this here. When we begin to add more slits, so here's three. What's going to happen is there's going to be more regions of constructive interference and more regions of destructive interference. And what that's going to do is it's going to narrow the spot size like that, and then narrow this, and like so. 
So this is a trend that we see. Um, and the reason we can say that, you know, light in, the, in this case behaves like a wave is because when we give the math treatment uh, to light as a wave and we uh, take the math treatment as how it interacts with these slits and then find out how it interacts down here, we are able to match both the physical observation we make and also uh, the, the math that says we should get these results. Um, so it's actually, it's really quite satisfying to see this happen. Um, but, you know, you don't have to be, uh, you don't have to be great at math to, you know, appreciate these results. You, you can just appreciate that, uh, that light itself is a wave and we can do a lot of really useful things with light uh, when we understand its uh, underlying characteristics. I mean, we take it, I think, you know, we've, before I got into the field of optics, I think we took it, or I took it for granted to just know that a light bulb was lighting up my room or that the screen was providing, uh, you know, an image of the documents that I'm looking at. Uh, but there's so much more that's ha happening. Um, and it's, it's, it's very, these effects are tiny and they're happening at thousands of interactions, millions, billions of interactions throughout our universe every time. Um, so it's, it's quite, quite a fun thing to explore and understand. Um, I'll take questions uh, now and just kind of sit down. Or we can continue to look at the wave tank. I'm not sure where I am on time. I'm about at 20 minutes. OK. Trying to see if I can load the comments. I think somebody might be coming into the room. Hmm. Okay. When did I first learn about this? Oh, okay. Hold on. There's a few questions now popping up. <laughs> uh, how does the wavelength of light affect the diffraction pattern? Okay. So, uh, first to just talk about, you know, what exactly the wavelength of light means. Um, basically, it's the spacing, the physical spacing of uh, the, uh, when, when the light wave repeats itself. Um, and so when you increase uh, the wavelength of your light, the, uh, the light and dark regions begin to increase in size uh, or begin to space apart. Uh, when we were viewing the whiteboard, the, the, the light regions space apart farther um, and there's some there's some physical intuition that you could, you know, kind of arrive at these results, which is the waves themselves are uh, larger, and so the uh, regions of constructive and destructive uh, constructive and destructive interference will be uh, larger themselves. So uh, that's kind of a way to approach this. Uh, so when did I first learn about uh, this? I think that a question is about uh, when did I first learn about diffraction? Um, and I learned about it just one semester ago. <laughs> um, 
you know, like I said, my background is in mechanical engineering. Nobody's coming into the room. And uh, yeah, so I, I had never been introduced to these concepts before. Um, and so, yeah, I just learned about it a semester ago. There's still a lot more to learn. And I think even once I finish this PhD, there's going to be even more to learn. And there's, there's centuries of work that, you know, people have written up in books. Um, and even if I read all the books, I still wouldn't know everything. And I think that's part of uh, accepting that we as humans, we don't really know much, um, but we're trying to make sense of the physical world around us. And uh, that's really what science is, is uh, how can we observe nature, quantify it, and then do something useful with it. Um, yeah, that's my take on it. So with that, it looks like time is, uh, I'm, I'm at time for sure. I've passed my time. Um, so I'm going to close this. Uh, thank you for joining me today. Uh, it was my first demo and I hope to do more and also improve uh, in terms of how, you know, we can demonstrate these concepts because, uh, you know, the biggest reason for me to be here today is not to see a video of myself explaining this. Uh, I really, I want to encourage some sort of curiosity in this field. Um, yeah. Oh, one more question. What's been your favorite niche topic so far in optics? That's a good question. Um, I think, you know, if on, on one hand, you know, I'm, uh, there's like four different tracks you can do here at the Wyant College. Um, you can kind of go the optical engineering track. Um, you can go the imaging sciences track. Uh, you can go the uh, like quantum physics track. Um, and my goodness, I'm spacing on the fourth track right now. Um, but, you know, so I went towards the optical engineering track and, uh, you know, the classes I have to take, I don't get to explore a lot of the like quantum physical or the, the quantum world, um, which I think there, there's a lot of really, I think there's a lot to learn um, in quantum physics that I think would be, uh, would really entertain my brain. Um, but I also recognize that, you know, as a career, I, you know, that may not necessarily be the road that I take. So uh, I have to do something that's, that's going to be something that I will continue as a career and always, uh, you know, be able to find enjoyment in. Um, not that I wouldn't be able to on the other side, it's just my brain naturally looks to, um, you know, build things and, uh, you know, solve engineering problems, um, not theoretical problems. <laughs> Trent asks, how did I become exceptional at using SOLIDWORKS? Uh, so SOLIDWORKS is a, uh, for, for all of you out there, um, SOLIDWORKS is a really cool um, 3D modeling tool. Uh, it allows you to basically model any physical object in uh, three dimensions. And, you know, you can build, you know, uh, like you can build models of a house, you can build models of a laser, you can build models of anything that's physical. And there's a lot of really cool things with it, too. You can do simulations on how, uh, you know, if you apply a certain stress or if you drop the object, you know, what's going to happen to the object. Um, and really, you know, these simulations, they're physics engines that propagate rules that we've learned in science uh, through the, you know, it propagates these rules through a bunch of math uh, on the computer. And there's a lot of great people that have done the work to uh, build these tools for us um, so that we can use them and not have to, you know, recreate all this math and recreate all the science. It's, it's all packaged into one thing for us. So I, uh, I, I encourage you guys to 
you know, explore these kinds of uh, software tools. Um, th there's so many of them. There's software tools for 3D modeling. There's software tools for modeling optical systems. There's software tools for uh, understanding chemical interactions. Um, and, you know, you can get pretty far, you know, even in high school or even in middle school, because if you're just curious about something, you know, you'll start asking questions and, you know, you'll find the right people if you kind of want to figure something out. So I definitely encourage just dabbling in these things, even if you don't know anything about light, um, just start, just start looking at the software. Or if you don't know anything about 3D modeling, just look at the software. It's great. Okay, I still taking questions. Three, two, one. Okay, I'm gonna uh, cut the live stream. Thank you all again for joining and uh, hope to see you again in the future.